State of immigration claim. Blow it up. Bloody red. White heat flashing. Stars in my eyes. Dizzy. Deaf and dumb distractions replacing authentic thoughts. Telescreens blare of bare flesh of false gods fallen from Valhalla. Olympic gold not mine stolen from the blistered fingers of his homeland. This is not your land. You don't own the sky, the water, the dirt, but it's sold to the highest center. Waving, flailing, fraying at the seams. This flag of our fathers, once whole and holy, Four generations of men, none who died in their beds. Just written off as Monaco, Monastock. Their dreams are better things still. Teens and seems through my veins. My family name still palpable. Faces, names, deeds. <coughs> Irish, Italian, African, Hispanic, Indian. Their words still in my head and my heart. That bleed through any banner or anthem. For it's their blood that paved these streets of gold. And I, Monaco Monastock, black and combustible as my heart may be, tend to take back what's ours. <laughs> Superpower of invisibility. Let's look at the state of the invisibility of black women. Good morning, I said to the conductor as he approached my seat to take my ticket. No response. So I figured he didn't hear me. Good morning, I said to the conductor as he took my ticket and gave me my receipt. No response I guess he didn't hear me again. So I figured, well, if he didn't hear me, then he had to have heard me because I heard him talking to another passenger. Hmm. He's not deaf. Maybe blind. Maybe he needs to see my black woman in Okay, I'll try again, because I am curious, and I do not like being ignored. One more time, from my big voice, deep in my belly. Morning! He ignores me again. He's not deaf. He's dumb. morning and there it is right on the front page another murder of a black kid this time in Chicago Laquan McDonald 17 years old a ward of the state student at an alternative high school 
shot 16 times by a cop named Jason Van Dyke. It's an ongoing nightmare. And it's been going on forever, but now there's videos. And the white establishment, white government, white Washington, D.C., white law, white people in general just can't ignore it anymore. It's like pins bursting the dream bubble, if I can use that term, borrowing from ta Coates. The dream, the illusion that America's the very best of all nations. Here is freedom, here's democracy. Here's the land of fair play. Here's the good guys, or so the story goes. We're faulted. Oh yeah, all nations are faulted. It's what we dish out in our history books to our kids and our movies and our corporate TV news. But then there's this 17-year-old black boy, shot 16 times, 16 times, echoes of how many other black young men and teenagers have been shot the past few years, either captured on video or after years such murders went unreported, finally, finally reported on the evening news. So I'm reading about this black kid and my mind runs back to my time as a teacher at Class Academy in Long Branch. <laughs> Class Academy, the poor cousin, the ignored school of the Monmouth County Vocational School District. And I think back to the ingrained racism at the school, especially of its director, Dominic Fiore, and of some but not all of its teachers, especially Maria Sand. <laughs> no. These well-meaning white teachers would scream and shout if they heard me call them what they were, and I'm sure still are and will be till they reach their graves. Racists and white supremacists. I mean, what's it called when the director of a school makes fun of a young man's name? Ibrahim, mocking it, not to a tough street kid's face which would require a little guts, but to his own teachers instead. Or what's it called when Sant, a so-called English teacher, has a book closet full of books for seven years that denigrate the intelligence of her own students? You know, some will say it's all innocent. But ignorance is no excuse when it comes to the very, very, very at-risk lives of the teenagers like the kids were at Class Academy. <clears throat> it takes a little imagination to know why I refer to the school now as Classless Academy. <laughs> it's in Neptune now, this institution of very questionable learning. I'd like to think it changed, but I can see no compelling reason why it has. Fiori's retired with a fat pension, unscathed, uninvestigated, with his cynicism still intact. The science teacher there who adamantly refused to carry the New York Times Science Weekly, even when I offered it to him, well, he's off in some administrative position and said, who knows? Probably in Neptune, still condescending to his students, teaching them how to fill out $10 an hour job applications and calling that an education. So, what's the connection, you might want to know, between Classless Academy, which is paid for by your tax dollars, and the murder of Laquan McDonald? Well, the connection is, is that this Monmouth County school had dozens of Laquan McDonalds. The connection is that the young Laquan had drugs in his system and was much more likely to be hurt or killed by cops than he should have been. The connection is, is that one of my former students in April of this year died of a drug-induced heart attack in his early 30s. This kid, this tough street kid, was given up on by the school system and sent to class academy. The connection is that I taught my classes about Baraka, Shakespeare, Dante, brought in some real good books, taught some real history, and even had my kids reading and writing their own essays and poetry in class every Wednesday and I got finally let go for tardiness. <laughs> the connection is, is that I didn't fight back hard enough for the kids. I let them kick me out without a legal battle. The connection is, is that my former student, we're just gonna call him Billy to protect his identity. Well, he wanted to call Channel 12 and state to sit down protest in the parking lot. And I told him and my other students, no, no. I told them they were already in a precarious situation and didn't want any more trouble and provoked the powers that be when I was gone. 
but it was all bullshit, you know. I should have fought harder for my kids, for Billy and Lil Kwan's of the world. Now Lil Kwan is dead. He had PCP in his system and couldn't stay out of harm's way. And Billy, dead from living life out on the edge instead of going to university or college with a strong recommendation from me. Billy, who came in with a shirt and tie and Dante in his hands and he taught my class after working with me for weeks on the phone. There were other kids, sure there were. Like Mario, the big Italian tough kid. Yeah, he was labeled a troublemaker since middle school. This Italian boy, he had studs around his neck, studs around his wrists, and he called me a window. You're a window, he said. And I can see through another, to another world, he said. And there was Rainier, a young black girl, a brilliant poet, who read at the school's Thanksgiving party at my request. She read her poetry, and the white teachers attacked her as a racist, which was totally inaccurate and wrong. While she was reading, I gave her the thumbs up, and I smiled at her. Dominic later called me in on this. I said, Dominic, do you think I would allow a student to read a racist poem at our school? He had no reply. <laughs> I wonder where Rainier is today. Maybe not someplace good. Or, you know what? Maybe she fought through with her brilliance and she landed someplace. But not Billy. And not Laquan. And not all the other Billies and all the other Laquans. You see, this, this is the connection. This is the connection. And this is why we're here talking to you tonight. No, 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 no. Such intensity of pain. Such intensity of pain. In this uncontainable night. There is such intensity of pain. When you are stripped of everything, your home, your means, your dignity, everything, you are bare to the world, the state of naked morality. If I took my clothes off for you, what would you do? How much do you love freedom? If I took off my clothes and walked off the stage and walked out the door and walked down Cookman Avenue, what would you do? Would you laugh? Would you scream? Would you try to cover me up? Would you tell me I'm crazy? What do you think the people on this street will do? Do you think they'll call the cops? How far do you think I'll get before some cruiser comes along and I'm taken off the streets, pushed into the back seat <coughs> of a car? Will the cops throw a blanket over me? Tell me I'm nuts? Tell me I'm indecent, that I'm breaking the mores of this gentrified city? What? Will I be molested in the station house? What? What do you think? I don't know. I don't get any of this so-called morality. All because I took off my clothes in public? You gotta be kidding me, right? But tell me, what would happen if I send my kid off to war? to kill people who have done him no harm. And he gets wounded. And he has his arms blown off or loses his legs. Then what? Are we gonna look at him and say, he is a good moral citizen? Or will he become some cliched Facebook hero? I'm sorry, I don't get any of this morality. What does it mean to be moral? What does it mean to be a patriot? Do I even like that word, patriot? 
Isn't that a reference to a fatherland? Nah, I much prefer my own term, <clears throat> matriot. Loyal to a motherland. Loyal to Mother Earth. Now that's the kind of morality that I can live by and honor. So what I'm saying is that in 2016, the notion of nationalism is obsolete. Our Earth can no longer tolerate artificial boundaries among nations. It's time for a leap forward in human evolution. It's time for a much fuller, better, wiser, more free human being. <coughs> Let's start by getting naked. First, emotionally and spiritually. And then, maybe later, physically. <laughs> judge me. Walk a mile in my shoes first. Not a metaphor, for real. Who am I? What size are you? Okay. Nine. Nine and a half. <laughs> that will work. <laughs> These are ten. I wear a nine and a half. But three shoes? What do you know? So walk through my day. See what I see. Then, hungry kids walk into school. <clears throat> hungry for food, knowledge, love. Hungry for happiness, hug. Joy and wonder. Walk down my block in my shoes, and you will see looks of worthlessness and despair on the faces of men standing idle on a floor. Unemployed, underemployed, hopeless. How to make it with no job? how to give the baby's mother some kind of money by nets, or how to get enough money to beat the rent man back from the door and stay out of eviction court. Get some pickup, some odd job, while waiting for a real job. While paying to pay Paul, to keep the lights on another month, Get enough to put something on it. But wait. It, it, it's winter. They won't cut my people doing what? Pay something on it when I get some. Well, I got that EBT card. I'll get it. Do think she's four? Mm -hmm. Who on Thursdays? They give out bread at the soup kitchen on Saturdays. Full meal today at lunchtime. Lunch is at 
11.30 seconds and 12.30. No leftovers now. We can't take anything home. <laughs> Back to what I'm talking. Check the book. New in the book. This might be something. Experience helpful but not required. Will train. This is good. <coughs> Eleven dollars an hour to start? Woo! That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> see someone else. His shoes are small for you, but fit them best you can. Just walk and listen to him tell about his journey in another lane. Wear my shoes and walk through another mile in Sumer. You say, Iraq. of my city. Live a life of being bombed, of the bombing of children, children crying, wailing, hungry every day. My stomach run. Walk in these shoes while I look for my cousin. He didn't come back. See through my eyes, children's limbs torn away from tiny bodies, skulls cracked or crushed by falling buildings or debris, mothers and fathers digging through rubble, hoping to hear a faint sound that might lead them to a still living child. Walk and hear the sounds of a soldier forcing a young woman to yield her soft self to him. Hear her soft sobs muffled by the dust and pieces of broken bread. Walk through my missed childhood, stolen by war, soldiers, and guns, and nothing for me. Not food, clothes, a mosque, a teacher, an imam, nobody to help. Just guns, bombs, dust. And noise, always noise. It's never quiet. It's never peace. Only noise sometimes, day and night.
So, stand in my shoes and tell me not to hate. Stand in my shoes and tell me not to retaliate. Stand in my shoes and talk me out of joining the Taliban or maybe Walk in my shoes and tell me how to forgive all the losses, all the abuse. Walk in my shoes. Walk. Listen to him. Listen to him. It's important. Let me tell you something. Despite the fact that you all ignore me, despite the fact that you look down on me, despite the fact that you think I am completely worthless, I love every single one of you. How can that be possible? Well, it's all I have left. The state of human love. Love is love is love. Gay love, straight love, love. So tell me, what is the difference between a man and a woman? between men loving men, women loving women, men loving women, women loving men. I mean, okay, it's been years since I've taken biology, but if I remember correctly, it's one chromosome on the DNA gene. I mean, the difference is that minimal, so let's just move on with it, okay? We didn't know, okay. No, it's not only biology that proves love is love, it's the spirit, the heart. I mean, if you can't understand lovers of the same gender, and by now, I'm not really even sure what gender is, then you just don't understand love, period. Desire, hunger, thirst, vulnerability, surrender. I mean, you just don't get it. I, I have to ask this, oh God, I wonder what really goes on in your heterosexual bedroom. I mean, between you and your husband, between you and your wife, I mean, are you really both playing with a full deck? I mean, are you really both fully present? I mean, is he really only a man? Is she really only a woman? Because it seems to me they're both. Both. I mean, in my body, my straight woman's body, I mean, I've had my own homosexual and bisexual fantasies. I mean, how on earth can that be unnatural? I mean, it seems pretty clear to me that to be fully human means just that, to be. That is so beautiful. So beautiful. You know, on my bad days, I sometimes wonder what my father would say if he could see me now. The state of remembering a father. This morning, I am weeping for my father, Augustine, August, Gus, Bob, Wistie, all of his names, August, Honorable, he was that, would have been 160. He died 39 years ago, yet I still remember him so clearly, his sad, soft, beautiful eyes, eyes that saw into the core of life and never became angry. Eyes that saw into my core and loved me unconditionally. Eyes that were noble, dignified, carrying the love of a very poor man who lived in furnished homes until the end. Eyes that never rose to the top of any heap, nor became an American aggressor. Eyes that were romantic, that loved woman, poetry, golf, and baseball. 
found his incipient poems in his tiny home in Jersey City as he lay dying, forced to abandon his home. I found his little notebooks, his scribblings of things he felt and he saw. My father was a good man. It's as simple and as great as this. My father was a great man. <coughs>
death machine, the Enola Gay, in the pre-dawn hours of August 6, 1945, for six and a half hours, six and a half hours, your manhood could have woken up and stopped you from being biggest mass murderers in human history. But your manhood never existed. And you dropped your atomic bomb on, wait, dropped your atomic bomb on what you and your friends had the gall to call Little Boy on Hiroshima, killing 250,000 people. What, Nick, the terrible men you guys will always be. Von Kirk, you finally died July 28th, 2015, and thank God your stench is off this planet. It's only a shame we had to bury you. It would have been much easier to incinerate you, like you incinerated 80,000 civilians in an instant and left the other 170,000 to suffer slow deaths, <coughs> miseries, cancers, horrors beyond belief. It's funny how we, America, continue to mourn the loss of the 3,000 we lost in the World Trade Center lie, and yet we honor the likes of you, who wiped out a quarter of a million people in one single horrific imagination to find that. You're right up there with Hitler. No, nope. you're worse than Hitler, although I should not and cannot say that. No, you're equal to Hitler in your depravity. But what gets me is that you live to be 93 years old. 93 years old! How the hell did you do it? You have no conscience? No human inside you? No love? Or were you just simply psychotic for the last 69 years? I don't have anything else to say tonight, except that I'm glad you're dead. There are some mushrooms that are magical, and there are some mushrooms that are poisonous. Remember, you reap what you sow. Now out here on the street you learn very quickly there are places you can go, and there are places you cannot go. It's called the law of turf, and it's changing constantly. I think you all call it by some other name. The state of new forms of colonialism. So, so this hope. Oh. This guy, Pope Francis, the fellow that even non-Catholics love and respect, he goes to Africa, to Kenya. And here's this passage from the New York Times. He steps out of his car and walks slowly past hundreds of hungry children who live in shanties. He heard of stories of gangs preying on women, of people dying from homemade alcohol, of sinister plots by businessmen to flood children out of their schools and steal land. Oh, what the hell? Where is this happening? Is this Kenya? Or is this Philadelphia? Is this Kenya? Or is this Patterson or the South Bronx? Or 
is this the Newark that Ross Baraka inherited? Or is this the Dakotas of 2015? Now, look, I can't say with so much. I'm just some guy who picks up the paper and sees what I see. The last thing that I see is this. This Pope Francis tells the people, I quote, corruption is something that eats inside. It's like sugar. It's sweet. It tastes good. We like it. It's easy. Please, don't develop that taste in the court. I like this guy. The Pope is cool, man. I know he'd see me. He'd look me right in the eye. Because the Pope, he doesn't see differences. That's what we do. We are drawn to similarities and fear the differences. Is that the root of prejudice? Look at the state of being a Jew. Yeah, I've heard it all. Hey, Jew, where are your pennies? How do you find a Jew? Just throw some pennies in the corner and watch them run. I don't pick up pennies. I wouldn't even pick up a quarter if the head's down. But I've been called all the usual names. Kike, he, Piney. Yes? I'm a Jew and I'm proud to be one. You know, we make up a very small minority in this world. As a matter of fact, our numbers are shrinking. But the stories go on how we control the media. <laughs> Have you watched TV lately or read the newspapers? We don't control the media or the banks. It's just people are so quick to hate us. Don't even get them started when they hear that our government supports Israel. You know, I've had to play down being a Jew so many times in my life for fear of ridicule. God, my mother even gave me the most non-Jewish middle name. Harris! Harris! <laughs> it's a lot easier to say than my given last name. Whenever I make reservations, I use Harris. Jews work hard, that's what we do. Just like the Greeks, the Italians, the blacks, the Catholics, and all the others who despise us. Sometimes we even have to work harder because we're not always accepted because we're a Jew. That's why we form tight-knit communities to survive. So the other day, I had a business colleague ask me if I Jew down a customer. I was in shock. Did he forget that I was a Jew? The same guy thinks it's crazy that I could love Kirk Vonnegut, who was born and raised in Indiana, the heartland, where Jews don't belong, and many still think have webbed feet and pointed ears. Non-Jews turn a deaf ear to anti-Semitism. They either don't know or they just don't care because they're not part of the minority. On high holy days, I go to the temple and I pray. And when I leave the temple to travel back home, I look around and I notice how many non-Jewish people there really are in the world. See, most non-Jews are oblivious to the importance of these days. Ignorant, they schedule important meetings or professors conduct tests without thought. It's not my holiday. I don't know, why should I care? All I can do to be a Jew is to try to hold my head up high and not be ashamed and live amongst the rest of the world in peace and silence. And that's what it's like to be a Jew in the world today.